Hello there, friends, family, and wedding photography enthusiasts. We're here again on the podcast. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to your podcast, it's the same old podcast. I've just started a new podcast YouTube channel, though. So if you're interested in seeing me and my face talk to a camera, then you can do that, too. That's an option for you. The podcast is taking a bit of a new format where I will come up with a topic that I wish to be talking about. Today, that's going to be the best lens for wedding photography, which I know is a very loaded question. And then typically I'll get into a bit of Q&A. So if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, feel free to plug some questions in the comments and I will see them and I will respond to them in a future episode. Here we go. Best lens for wedding photography. Also, this is a new channel, so consider subscribing and click the button if you're, if you're interested in that. So let's get to the loaded question. The best lens for wedding photography. I know it's a question that comes into Google a lot. A lot of people wonder, and even 20 years into my career, I'm still like, is that, is that 50, one, two going to make me a better photographer? Should I get it? Should I spend the money? And the answer is yes. It's a really nice lens. But as photographers, I feel like we're always in, in this search for the, the perfect lens. that's going to make all your wildest dreams come true and book you more work and allow you to go on more wonderful five-star vacations. And up until this past year, my lens selection was the exact same. When I got into wedding photography a long, long, long time ago, my first lens, I think, was a 35 F2 Nikon DSLR lens. And I did it simply because it was the cheapest way to get a pretty good quality uh, object on my camera, object being a lens. It was the easiest way to get good optical quality at that time. Uh, zooms were, I don't know, some of them were fine. Most of them were terrible and they were also very expensive. So having a 35, it was an APS-C crop body. So it was more like a 50 and I use that lens quite a lot. That was my main lens. And then when I got into shooting two camera bodies at wedding days, uh, one of them became a full frame camera, the Nikon D700. And I continued to use that 35 and I added an 85 onto my second camera and I started using that way more. I love the look and the feel of images that I got from that 85 millimeter lens. It was, uh, I would say it was a game changer for me. And every time I say the word game changer, I think of the get him to the Greek game changer. And if you haven't watched that movie, go watch it or look at that clip up on YouTube after this. Cause it's, it's a good one. It's a real game changer. The 85 1.4 basically took my photos from like, yeah, those are pretty good. And then I applied no new knowledge. And I went out and I shot the same thing in the same lighting and the images were just way better. And I know we're supposed to say gear doesn't matter and that it's all the artists that does the stove make your food? No, you make your food. I don't know. The stove and the, the camera and the lens, they do have a pretty good impact. And especially now in terms of how easy it is to take great photos, the fact that your camera probably has great eye uh, tracking if you if you have one of the newer mirrorless cameras colors are good and I'm running this camera for the YouTube version of this video on auto white balance and also on uh, aperture priority and I think it's doing a pretty good job so cameras are getting smarter even Sony can get get good auto white balances now wow what a time to be alive so 3585 was my I guess my two lenses of choice for a very 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 long time I found that I could get through an entire wedding day with them. I enjoyed all the images. I enjoyed the experience. I never really got into a 50 until also this year. I found that the 85, uh, I'm a lot more introverted and I didn't really like being that close to my couples. And I found that the 85, uh, Manny Ortiz and I joke that it's the introvert lens. Uh, we did a, I don't know, kind of a podcast sit down talk uh, two years ago in Japan. And we kind of came up with the fact that it's like, it, it allows you that distance to feel comfortable. And if you are somebody that's uh, in the wedding photography space, there's a pretty good chance you're attracting your ideal couples and your ideal couples are going to be a lot like you. So if you're an introverted person, you're probably going to be working for a lot of other introverted people and all people in my experience on wedding days that they're, they're not really super comfortable in front of the camera. Um, the only time I, I did a, a wedding in Italy this past year, they got published in People Magazine, which is pretty awesome. And uh, that's the only time that I've ever worked with a professional model um, or actress, I guess, Serena Vincent, uh, on a wedding day. And it was awesome. I got to, it's it's like you're doing a shoot with a professional model. You point the camera, you give a suggestion here and there, but otherwise they just know what to do. And they do a lot of the work for you. But most of the time, uh, my couple's shy, quiet, introverted, and uh, that 85 
helps them feel a little bit more comfortable, helps me feel a little bit more comfortable and lets the day or the engagement session just flow a little bit better. Now, over the years, I've used a lot of different lenses. I've used some 20 millimeter lenses. I've used some 40 millimeter lenses, 45 tilt shift, and they've all been fun. They're fun tools. Uh, I think that, again, I guess, again, going back to the, the gear doesn't make you a better photographer. In a lot of ways, it inspires you, at least. If you get that 45 tilt shift, you go out there and you're, you're taking some fun images and you way overdo it. And you get home and you're like, man, I should have laid back on the, the tilty shifty there. But that's locked in time forever. I hope that you enjoy it, couple. And I think a good piece of gear really does inspire you to get out there. I think the same with the camera body. Uh, if you get that, that Leica M6, it's not going to make you take better pictures, but it is going to inspire you to get out there. Uh, the Fuji X100V, I feel like, is the, the hype camera maybe of the year if the M6 isn't. And I feel like it's kind of the same, that it gives you an excuse to get out there. It's a fun tool to use, and you just enjoy the experience, so you want to do it more. I've never personally found myself gravitating towards wider lenses for wedding days. Uh, I do really love the look and the feeling of a lens like a 24 f 1.4 when you shoot it at 1.4. That wide angle, shallow depth field, if you get nice and close to your subject, looks really, really incredible. And it's not a look that you see really that often. So it is a look that I enjoy. But I think in practicality, something like a 35 is a little bit more useful on a wedding day. I'm also speaking to, if you follow the main channel, um, my main YouTube channel, you know a lot of the weddings that I shoot that they're, um, I'm going to say maybe 100 guests, 120 guests. Uh, they're not huge. I'm not doing like multi-thousand person weddings that I need to do group shots of 150 people and yelling and screaming and whatnot. Um, my weddings for the most part are pretty chill and pretty low mid-range guest counts, I guess. Um, I don't do a whole lot of elopements. I do a little bit of elopements, but overall, my standard wedding, I would say, is at like 100, 150 guest range. And I rarely find myself needing anything wider than a 35 on a wedding day, with the one exception being the cake cut. My joke is always that I have the, I have the Sony 20 millimeter that I'm filming this on, and it is always my cake cut lens. I don't know what the deal is. I always slam it into a corner and I got to contort myself weirdly to get that shot. So I think it is important to have something wide or, or even a zoom that is a little bit of a wider zoom in case you find yourself either in a situation that you um, just really need to get the shot or maybe you're doing it's raining outside and you're doing all the group photos inside and you don't have a lot of space. Uh, or if you just see something that's creatively amazing that you show up to a venue and you're like, wow, I need a 14 to get this shot. It's very helpful to have something wide in the bag. I would say in terms of cost, while it is important to have a professional quality tool, if you're a professional wedding photographer, I don't think that I'd be spending the, the bonus money um, on something like a Sony 14 GM. I would get something that would just kind of get me by. Since it is a lens that I will use on a wedding day, but I use it very, very limitedly, um, I think a 35 is a great wide end to, uh, well, let's just talk about it now. So in my opinion, the best lens right now, and the, somebody joked on the channel that people aren't switching to Sony, they're switching to Tamron. And I think that that is correct. The 35 to 150 F2 to F2.8 is, in my opinion, uh, again, this is all from my experience, my opinion, is the best lens for wedding photography. Um, I'm going to put a period there. That that's, uh, that is my opinion. For ceremonies, it is absolutely the best lens. It gives you so much more versatility than if you were shooting with something like a 7200. 7200 is amazing, but you lose that wide end when people get a little bit close to you, or you just have to kind of move a little bit faster to get away from a couple of when somebody's coming down the aisle and you're waiting for them. And then there's kind of an exchange and there's usually like maybe four people all like shaking hands and hugging and stuff. And you kind of got to get back real far with a 35 to 150 Tamron. You don't have to do that. You just go to 35 and you can kind of stay where you're at. In terms of versatility for a ceremony, absolutely 100% the best lens ever made for us as wedding photographers. Throughout the rest of the day, also incredible lens. Uh, I would say that it is the best lens. And the I guess the sad part with it is that it is heavy. So if you're using it as a main lens for the entire wedding day, it's not going to be the lightest lens. So you kind of have to, I guess, balance that. So in my opinion, best lens but also heavy. So it might make more sense to be on something like a 35 or a 50 uh, for a lot of the day, just simply because you don't want to be carrying that thing around. But that's something I guess for, for you to discover on your own. It's also a bit expensive. It, in my opinion, it 100% replaces my 7200. So I don't need to get a 7200 any longer. 
the, the 35 to 150, especially I'm going to be shooting a lot of this year on the Sony a seven R five and you have so many megapixels. And when you go into APS-C mode, you still have, I think 33 megapixels. So if you're in APS-C mode, so that means you're, you're 35 to 150. When you get to the 150 end, you can hit the button. I have my C2 button up on top of my camera set to APS-C mode and I can just bounce into that quickly. And then you get whatever 150 times 1 1.5 is to 25 millimeters. So you have that coverage, that 7200 coverage within this lens, but you also get the wide end, which is really cool. Another downside with this lens is it only comes for Sony right now. And that kind of sucks. I wish this came for everything, but there's a bit of a lockout on third party glass for Canon right now for the Canon RF. Uh, they're after some, some folks for making some nice lenses. Samyang 85 1.4 was probably my favorite lens, or I guess it still is for the Canon ecosystem, even though it's kind of a contraband lens and you can't buy it in stores anymore. And you can, I guess, try to find a good use copy if you can, because unfortunately they are just not going to exist. And I hope that Canon replaces it with an 85 F 1.4. That's, um, maybe L or maybe L ish glass or L enough. Um, the 85 F two is fine, but it's not as good as that Samyang. So I'm hoping that Canon put something in that slot uh, because the 85 1.2 is too heavy and too expensive. Beautiful glass, lovely, lovely tool to use. I used it, um, I'm gonna say the 2020, pretty much the entire summer, everything I shot was on that lens. And I actually got a repetitive strain injury on my left wrist, which is interesting because my right typically holds all of the weight, but it was holding the weight in a normal way that it was used to. And my left hand supporting the lens just wasn't used to supporting that, I guess, the, the weirdness of it. So it's, it's a heavy boy and it's a beautiful choice, but it's not my choice. My choice, again, goes to the 35 to 150 Tamron. It's a real, real joy to use. Mine, unfortunately, has broken though. So maybe another downside is that a zoom that does so many things Maybe there's a tendency for something to go wrong with it. Um, it is in for service with Tamron USA right now. So I'll report back whenever I know more. I'm hoping they just fix it. It kind of became a tilt shift. And fortunately, it was on the last wedding of the season that I noticed it. So I was able to swap quickly to the 50 1.2 for Sony and get through the rest of the day. Um, I will say, so the, uh, there's a potential positive or potential negative, depending on your personal preference. With the Tamron 35 to 150, there are different focal lengths that feel like there's kind of a one eighth mist filter on it. You'll notice this if headlights point at your camera that they seem a little bit soft in the, the exact same way that a mist filter, a very low intensity mist filter would. They don't give like weird flares like mist filters tend to, but it is something to be aware of. I personally for weddings love that look and I'm happy that it comes with this weird built in mist filter, but I could see if you're after kind of that optical perfection that this might not be the lens for you. But for me, it's kind of awesome. Uh, the 35 F2 side of it really has an incredible look and feel to it. Uh, the images that come off this lens, I'm just happy with entirely across the board, but specifically at 35 and at 150, which is, I don't know if that's normal or if that's weird. And honestly, I probably do find myself using those focal lengths most of the time, um, I feel like I maybe do 20% of my coverage somewhere in the middle. And that's usually just for ceremony, just trying to get the shot that I need without moving too much. But then when it comes to a time that I have a little bit more control of the day, I would say the most time I'm at 35 or 150 ish, I guess. Uh, the other, I guess, amazing thing is that the versatility of the lens. So say for instance, you have a couple and they're walking towards you. You can now get so many different shots that look very different, but cohesive in 25 seconds. They're walking towards you. You start at 35, you zoom into 150, you zoom back out, you go vertical, you take a few frames. All of a sudden you have a lot of different variations of that same shot that look a lot different. Um, the 24 to 70, I guess we'll talk about that for a little bit. It's never been my favorite focal length. I would prefer to use a 50, 1.8 or 1.4 or 1.2 over 24 to 70, I found that it never really, it didn't really improve my photography. It sure it, it'll get you through the day and maybe it is a good tool for that. But in my personal preference, again, this is all just my opinion here in my personal preference. I think that I would prefer to use a 50 or even a 35 F 1.4 prime and walk around a little bit rather than using a 
24 to 70. When it comes to travel photography, love a 24 to 70. Love the Nikon Z series 24 to 70 f 2.8 S a lot. I think that's my favorite 24 to 70 ever made. And out in the world, it's really, really nice on a wedding day. I don't find myself using it that much. I would prefer the additional or the, the lack of depth of field that I'm able to uh, produce with a prime lens simply because you don't really have control over all of your surroundings all the time. Also aesthetically, it looks a heck of a lot prettier, I think, to be shooting at f1.4 or 1.8 and being locked to f2.8, say on a 24 to 70 or even maybe f4 on some of them. I think that it's just not as pretty and also you just get more background elements, especially during getting ready coverage. So there's just a lot going on usually. And if you can minimize that through depth of field and just basically erase it and make it nice, beautiful out of focus elements in camera, I would recommend doing that. So yeah, those are my thoughts. If you're watching this on the YouTube video, feel free to put a comment in and tell me what your favorite lens is. Or if you have any questions specifically about anything that I've talked about today, feel free to plug it in. Also, Book More Weddings 2023, which is my flagship course for all things wedding photography. It also comes with a huge amount of bonuses, which uh, I don't even want to start listing them here because it's just an overwhelming amount of stuff. Uh, there is a link down below to head on over there. There's two options. You can either buy it straight out as a bundle, so you get some, some bonuses with it, or if you do sign up for the membership website for a year and you're not locked to a contract or anything, you can cancel at any time. But for $20 more, you get access for a full year to the member's website and it comes with so much more. It comes with everything that I've ever made in terms of wedding photography. Uh, you get my preset pack as well as some LUTs and you get a course on hybrid photo video coverage and how to make a wedding film as a wedding photographer. As well as a lot of downloads, there's templates for welcome guides. There are initial client inquiries, real meetings that, I, that, I, that you can listen to and listen to how I actually do a full meeting with a couple. It is honestly the best deal in wedding photography education. So uh, head on over there if you're interested and get in before January 20th because January 20th, it goes offline. So you're, if you get it before that, you, you have access to it, but you can't buy it in between January 20th and March 1st. So March 1st, it will be released again to the public, but basically the idea is to give everybody a head start on this new stuff in this course. So if you're interested, head on over there, link in the description.